Hi everyone. In this video, I'd like to talk about the critical lens of erotic analysis in our larger discussion of critical media studies. Now, before we jump in, just take a deep breath. We're not talking about that kind of erotic analysis. We're not going to talk about, we're not jumping into porn or anything like that, really. Uh, that's not the kind of erotic analysis we're going to be uh, looking at. I mean, I suppose you could if you really want to choose that as an artifact, but um, what we mean by erotic analysis is something a little bit different. So let's just, first of all, start by defining that. Erotic analysis examines artifacts in relationship to uh, the sensuous, transgressive, and productive pleasure exhibited by the audience. And the key word there really is pleasure. When we talk about erotic analysis, we're talking about what is it that gives the audience pleasure in, in this artifact? Why is the audience taking pleasure in this artifact? And, and in what ways are they expressing that pleasure um, with this artifact? So, um, so that's what we mean by erotic analysis in general. So let's take a, a little bit deeper look here. Some of the major premises uh, for erotic analysis, first of all, it, uh, number one is that people engage with media that bring them pleasure. It's not terribly surprising, right, that we tend to want to do things, we choose to do things that bring us pleasure, that that uh, bring us some some happiness and some joy, some contentment and some, um, you know, or bring us some sort of pleasure in any way. So people engage with media that bring them pleasure. And we find that there are two kinds of pleasure in particular that people draw from um, these types of artifacts. The first is what we call transgressive pleasure, which has to do with being different. We, we enjoy uh, artifacts, we enjoy um, different types of media that are different, that stand out because of that. That don't necessarily, I mean, there's something to be said for, uh, you know, doing the same thing as everybody else. That's why there are, you know, after Friends had such popularity, there were a run of shows that tried to be the new Friends, so to speak, right? And that's why there's, you know, 15 versions of NCIS and four versions of CSI and whatnot. So um, there's there's that pleasure that comes from, from familiarity and things like that. But we really uh, take a great deal of pleasure audiences do in transgressive pleasure, in something that is different from the norm, something that, that zigs when everybody else is zagging, right? Um, that's what we mean by transgressive pleasure. So uh, one example this we can see in the, in the mid 20th century, Norman Rockwell was one of the great American painters, right? But painted scenes that were f familiar and were comfortable for people painted scenes like this, the after prom where, um, where, you know, where these are, these are things that we know that we're familiar with. Plus the art itself is pretty straightforward. I mean, it's, it's really incredible. I don't have that kind of talent, but, but the, the scene and the, the way that it's painted, there's nothing really, um, that starkly different from uh, other standard uh, painters of that time. But then you see uh, the emergence and, and real popularity of artists, um, such as Andy Warhol with his version of pop art, what's called pop art there uh, with the different colors, but familiar topics, uh, but different colors and painting them in a different way than, than they'd ever been uh, envisioned before, maybe. And then uh, also things like Jackson Pollock and the abstract art scene, very, very different from Norman Rockwell, right? There, he's not painting Jackson Pollock's, Pollock is not painting a scene of kids at the, at the soda shop uh, during the after prom. Right. It's 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 confused in some ways. It's messy, but it's different. And that's what makes it stand out. That's what kind of gives us pleasure. Not only the discovery of something different uh, and being kind of on the, the cutting edge, of you know, but the leading edge of that type of thing. But just that it's so different from anything else that was available at that time um, really makes it stand out and makes it something that audiences take a great deal of pleasure in. So we have that kind of transgressive pleasure there. If we go to, you know, more modern media, a little more modern. Uh, Seinfeld is a great example of transgressive of pleasure. Um, it's hard to imagine that because it became such a juggernaut, such a huge hit um, that, that, uh, that it was so well known. But at the beginning, they had trouble getting any episodes made that trouble, you know, first it was just going to be one episode special. And then they gave him a couple more, they gave him like four episodes and then it was eight. And then it was, you know, eventually it took off and, and found its footing and, and really, but it, the reason it was so slow going is that it was so different from anything else that was on TV at that time. It was just not like anything else. It was, I mean, it proudly a show about nothing. There was no purpose to the show. I mean, they had a whole episode, a whole half hour episode where they're doing nothing but waiting for a table at a Chinese restaurant. 
that's the whole episode and they're having conversations and it's funny and there's some comedy, you know, that type of thing. But really the whole episode is just, there's no purpose to it. There's nothing special going on. They're just waiting for a table at a Chinese restaurant. Uh, that's what made it so different. There was no larger theme. There was no real sense of, uh, of major drama. There's no, any of this kind of thing. So, and there were never any very special episodes of, of Seinfeld, right? I mean, in that, in that sense of the, uh, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, there were lots of very special episodes, right? Even on comedy. They had these very special, very serious episodes, um, but not in Seinfeld. It was just very different, and that made it a transgressive pleasure. It was just um, something that was, you know, so different from the, the norm. Uh, a little more uh, currently, you can see that in The Office, too. We won't go into great detail on this, but... But we see that very much so in the office. Again, from the slow start, it was slow to pick things up because it was so different. People didn't know what to make of it, the mockumentary style and just the, the type of humor. And, and was was Michael Scott, you know, was he a bad guy or was he an idiot or was he just, you know, so desperate for, for attention and uh, and friendship that he was doing these I, I, You know, there were all these different questions. It was so different. And it's become very, very popular, obviously. But uh, but it was a tra real transgressive pleasure, especially at that time when it first started uh, in the, in the United States, and especially when, when it was uh, the, the original British version was even more transgressive, obviously. So um, anyway, so we take pleasure when things are different, things are new, things are, are not what we expect from them. Um, we also have this uh, type of pleasure that, that comes from what we call productive pleasure. And these two things are not mutually exclusive. Lots of times things that are transgressive are also productive, um, but they don't have to be connected all the time. But productive pleasure has to do with this creation, this idea of creation, that we as an audience, especially with the um, technological means that are available to us in the new media era, we can be productive as well. We can be creators. We can be co-creators really and expand upon these things that we love. And if, if we really have a piece that moves us, we can become a part of that by, uh, by creating alongside that piece. So yeah, one um, kind of easy example of seeing this is fan fiction. You know, when fans pick up these storylines and we take these beloved characters and these stories and these familiar worlds and we create within them, then we create our own things, you know, so we, we, we write stories about what if Harry Potter was a Jedi or what if Kirk and Spock were gay and, and, and a couple and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, uh, just, just all kinds of things that we can write. We, if we can imagine it, then we can, we can set it out in this fan fiction. This, we can, we can be productive. We can do some creation or maybe we're inspired by something that we see to create our own type of thing. You know, one of the, the most famous examples of this is, is 50 shades of gray. Obviously, it actually, it's a started out as fan fiction for the Twilight series. You know that the author E.L. James, which is her, her pen name, E.L. James, um, started writing fan fiction based on the Twilight series. In fact, the original uh, characters were you know based on characters from the Twilight series, and then as it grew and grew in popularity, and was you know she changed the names and gave it a whole different world so to speak and uh, but uh, but really started out as fan fiction based on the twilight series and then grew into this idea of 50 shades of of gray uh, over time and that kind of productive pleasure this idea that we can um, be a part of something and we can we can create in that world we can expand upon that world that really excites us and brings the audience uh, pleasure of that sort as well there are two different kinds of really transgressive texts as well. When we think about transgressive texts and the categories there, um, the, the first is what we call readerly text. A readerly text is, it's just, you know, it's the captain obvious of transgressive texts. Uh, readerly texts are what they seem to be. There's not a whole lot of, uh, uh, of subtext there. Really, there's not a whole lot of um, uh, subtlety going on. You know, the Jaws movies are about a shark trying to eat somebody. And so really it's about um, having the crap scared out of you. You know, and liking that. I mean, that's what they're there for. That's what they're, there's no real subtlety or subtext behind the Friday the 13th movies, right? They're slasher movies and that's what they're there for. Uh, and that's fine. There's, there are lots of uh, movies and TV shows that are just very surface level and that's what they are. That's what we call readerly text. And um, when it's right there on the surface and it's really obvious what that show is trying to accomplish or what they're trying to, to say or do. The other type of text, though, is what we call writerly texts, writerly texts. And these are texts are, and, and artifacts that are um, not so obvious, that may have a little more uh, subtle message, may have some subtext going on, may engage the audience a little more in um, in 
you know, what is this saying? What, how do I interpret this? And how is this different from other people in the way that they're saying it? What do I think that means? And so these are the types of shows and, and articles and, and books and things that, that really develop those strong online communities where people are sharing ideas about, well, what do you suppose that meant? What do you think this means for the show or whatever? Um, so uh, just as an example, again, kind of contemporary media terms. Uh, one of my favorite shows is 911. Love 911. I think it's an awesome show, uh, but it, and it's pretty. It, there's not a lot that's that's below the surface. I I think it's well done. It's well acted. It's well shot. It's uh, so I'm not criticizing the show. I really do enjoy it. It's one of my favorite shows. But it is what it is. It's a show about rescue attempts and people getting in the craziest situations, right? And I mean they're not doing uh, well, hours, you know, of TV on you know them showing up for a heart attack or just to fight a regular fire. It's something massive that's gone wrong and something spectacular and some, and it is what it is. It's, it's there for your enjoyment to watch them try and get in out of these situations. And, and it's, so it's action and it's, but it's right there. It's a readerly text. 911 is a readerly text. It just is what it is. As opposed to one, another show that we watch, my wife and I really enjoy is uh, The Handmaid's Tale. And if you're familiar with that, you know that it is very much a writerly text. There is so much there to try and interpret, to try and understand, to try and figure out what does that mean down to the idea of, you know, what do the different colors of cloaks mean? Why, why are the handmaids all wearing red? You know, and the, 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 uh, the, the, the wives of these, these men, the, the, the wealthier women are all wearing green. And, and, you know, so they, I mean, there's color coding obviously going on in this culture. What does that mean? What does that signify? What does it mean? Um, when this happens with the character, what is there all kinds of discussion about, you know, what do you think that means or who's doing this or what's going to happen to this person? And what, you know, those types of things, that's a writerly text. It's not right there on the surface. There's, I mean, there's plenty to enjoy right on the surface. But there's also a lot of ways to really dig into that and determine, you know, what's not only that, but what's this uh, creator saying? What's the message of the show? What are they trying to convey uh, with this? So there's a lot to be had there in terms of a writerly text in something like The Handmaid's Tale. So uh, there are different types of, of transgressive texts, some that are, you know, and this, these all exist on a spectrum. Every show exists kind of on this continuum of you know, extremely readerly or extremely writerly and, and so forth. And so it just kind of depends on where it falls, I guess, in that situation. So the, those are some of the, the, the key premises. There's, there's more to this, but, uh, but those are some of the key ideas here um, for understanding erotic analysis and really the idea of pleasure and how we, uh, pleasure drives what we watch and how we watch it, how we interpret it. Some of the more common questions that we see in erotic analysis are things like, in what ways does this artifact represent transgression in its historical context? Now, remember, Again, Seinfeld now and, and The Office now are these huge hits. They set the stage that lots of shows are like that now, right? That they're not, they're not going against the grain so much. They're not stepping outside of convention as much now. But when they first started, they were. So we need to look at these things in context. So in the historical context of when that show first, first appeared, first gained popularity, and really um, was, was at its peak, and what ways did it represent transgression? What ways did it go against the grain? What ways did it step outside of convention and in that historical context? Um, we also need to consider, is this artifact more readerly or writerly? Is there more to that beneath the surface? Is there, or is it right there? Not a whole lot of guessing of what this show is trying to accomplish and what it's trying to do. And then why? Why do you say it's, it's either readerly or writerly? Uh, what uh, what uh, would lead you to that conclusion? How does the artifact invite productive interaction with this audience? Remember, production has to do with productive pleasure has to do with uh, creation. So in what ways does this artifact get people moving in terms of creativity? How does it engage people? How do they, you know, is there a lot of fan fiction? Is there cosplay? Is there you know, people showing up for conventions? Those types of things. How does this an artifact invite that kind of productive interaction? How does it encourage that? And how does it, you know, help, help, uh, help it manifest within its audience? And, and how does it take advantage of that? And then what evidence exists of transgressive and productive engagement on the part of the audience? So thinking about this strictly from the uh, part of the audience, what do you see the audience doing? You know, in what ways are they engaging with this and interacting with the, the text itself? I hope this gives you a better understanding of what we mean by erotic analysis. Again, really didn't get into porn at all, do we? So erotic analysis has to do with pleasure. And I hope this gives you a new perspective on 
uh, again, just the impact that these things have on the audience and the response and the interaction that the audience can have with an artifact and, and the way that we can analyze that and consider that as a, as a piece of our critical media studies. If you have questions about erotic analysis or anything related to uh, critical media studies in general, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to answer any questions that I can via email. In the meantime, I hope that you will get out there with your new understanding of erotic analysis, understanding that it's not, you know, a triple X feature necessarily, but it's just the idea of what is it about this that gives us pleasure? Why are people drawn to it? And what pleasure do they take from it and, and provide as a result of this artifact? So I hope this helps you uh, gain some perspective on that. And I hope that you go out there and have a new and enhanced appreciation for those types of things as we see them in our society.